And welcome to this morning's worship experience. We are just so excited that you are here with us. We're so excited that we get to share this Christmas time with you guys. And I just want to welcome you guys. My name is Alyssa. Thank you so much for being a part of our service today. If you're joining us online, please comment and please let us know that you are here. And for tithes and offerings this morning, if you would like to give, please send an e-transfer to vpcctreasurer at Outlook. Dot com. Or if you're joining us in person, you can place your givings in the box, which is located at the front of the stage. Today, I just want to mention to you guys about our Christmas Eve service. It is coming up this Friday, December 24th, and we really hope that you will join us for this time of celebration of the birth of Jesus Christ. The service is going to be at 6.30 p.m. You guys are welcome to come in person, or you can join us online. We will be live streaming it again on Friday, just like we do on a Sunday on our Facebook page. So please join us at 6.30 p.m. for this wonderful time as we remember the birth of Jesus Christ and everything that he brings to this world. We will be remembering that Jesus is hope. Jesus is love. Jesus is joy. Jesus is peace. And most of all, Jesus is light. And the light that we get to give to one another is symbolized by our candles. So come on out Friday, December 24th at 6.30 p.m. We cannot wait to see you. Now let's get this service started. Good morning, everybody. Good to have you here. Good to have some of you joining us online. Why don't you stand with us? We'll start with some worship.
how you chose to enter the world born as one of us forgive our lack of faith and belief in ways which seem so impossible to believe help us to look in faith open our belief and set aside our doubts that you sent your son to be born of a virgin the one who has come to set us all free we offer these prayers in the name of your Son, Emmanuel, God with us. Amen. From God, our Heavenly Father, a blessed angel came, and under certain shepherds brought tidings of the same.
We follow the stars We follow the yearning Inside our hearts For something more That we cannot see We look to the sky We're looking for Search for a place where we belong We search to find me to believe that Christmas is already here. I think every week it, or every month, every year, there, there, I finally get it right, kind of sneaks up on us. But here we are, fourth Sunday of Advent, and we're going to finish off our series we've called The Characters of Christmas, and I have to admit there were a few that we could have finished up with. I, I love the story of, of Joseph's faith, be a good one, or maybe Simeon. I love the, the priest and the story of Jesus being brought to the temple when he's eight days old. But we're going to finish up with a, a different Christmas character this week. And it's one that I have to admit that we're... This character is absolutely everywhere, and yet I think we struggle sometimes to really understand. To really... like They're, they're, they're in the background. They're, we, we sang about them this morning several times. We just don't think a whole lot about them. So this morning we're going to talk about the angels. And so to start off with talking about the angels, I think the first thing we have to do is kind of demystify a little bit or or de, how can I put this, Um, take away some of the clutter that we have surrounding angels in our culture. 
And part of the problem is that we let things other than the Bible kind of tell us who the angels were. I had a, a church I was in years ago. I had a lady about Christmas season come up to me and said, just want you to know that I like angels. Don't say anything bad about angels. I was invited over to her place once, and she had angels everywhere. Not just at Christmas, in the middle of July. She had angels everywhere. She, just, she collected angels. She, she loved angels. I said, don't say anything bad about angels. So I tried not to say anything bad about angels. But sometimes we have this, this idea about angels that really is not quite right. And sometimes, I'm not saying that this is the case for this lady, but sometimes we're even tempted to worship the angels. So a couple things I just want to mention before we get going. Angel's wings. Well, you know, there's actually a discussion out there that, as to whether or not angels have wings or whether or not angels could exist without wings. So we had three kids come up here this morning. They had their angel costumes on, but they didn't have any wings. Somebody mentioned that to me. How come they're not wearing wings? I'm going, well, you're just going to have to listen to my sermon. Angel's wings. And, and, and part of our problem is we get our theology from places like, you know, It's a Wonderful Life. And you remember that, that great scene right at the end of the movie where, where Zuzu Bailey says, Look, Daddy, teacher says every time a bell rings, an angel gets his wings. No. Bad theology. That's not true. In fact, there are some who say that angels don't have wings. And to them, I usually want to quote Isaiah 6 2. Above him were seraphims, each with six wings. With two wings, they covered their faces. With two wings, they covered their feet. And with two wings, they were flying. Six wings. It's hard to sometimes find that in, in art, but yes, there are six wings on a seraphim, apparently. Those who say no wings would push back with Genesis 18 too. Abraham looked up and saw three men standing nearby. And when he saw them, he hurried from the entrance of his tent to meet them and bowed low to the ground. And, and theologians have long known that these three men that came to Abraham were angels. And yet they looked like three men. They, they, they looked like us. They, did, they didn't have wings. And so part of the solution, and this is admittedly man's solution, is that we begin to develop a hierarchy of angels. So seraphim, for instance. According to some Jewish rabbis, they're at the very top of the list. According to some, they're number three on that list of ten. On some, they're right in the middle. They're number five of the list of ten. And one ancient Jewish rabbi actually put seraphim at number ten of ten as the lowest possible angel that there could be. But we don't know. That's just our own, our own ideas. Those who really strenuously argue that maybe angels didn't have wings often say that angels were, are, are, are fire. And therefore, they might have something that looks like wings, but that they aren't really wings. What's the truth? Who knows? I don't. But angels might have wings. They might not have wings, and that's okay. Number two, you will never be an angel. Sorry if I'm destroying your, your theology this morning. But you will never, ever be an angel. When you die and go to heaven, you do not become an angel. As much as there are people out there that want to tell you that. As much as you want to believe that Aunt Sally, who passed away, you know, 10 years ago, uh, and she was just the sweetest lady you ever knew, uh, and she's up in heaven, and she's an angel now, no, she's not. Angels were created beings. They were different from us. And depending on the passage of, of Scripture, they were, we are either slightly above the angels or slightly below the angels. David says below. He says we were created a little lower than the angels. But other passages say that we were created a little above the angels because we have the idea of having free will. We are able to do things where the angels couldn't. But you are not an angel. None of you are. You will not be an angel. Angels are, are different. They are a different character of, of created being. Dying and going to heaven and becoming an angel would be like the dream of going to bed tonight and waking up tomorrow as a dog just not going to happen. They're different beings. 
Angels are messengers. All the way through the scripture, angels were messengers. This is what they did. This was their purpose. They came with a, with, with a message. And so when we, when we read from Genesis 18, we saw the three men came down. And they went and they talked to Abraham. And they had a message to bring to Abraham. And actually, it was the message that Isaac would be born. They were going to tell Abraham and Sarah that in their old age, they were going to have a baby, and they would call, his, they, they would call him Isaac. So they came with, with, with this message, message for them. They also came, if you read the passage, so they could go to Sodom and Gomorrah and find out what was happening. Now, we struggle with that because we think, well, God should have known what was happening. But he sent his angels down as his, as his messengers to go to Sodom and Gomorrah to see if there was any way that they could be taught a different path, a different message from God. But they didn't accept the message. And that was the problem. But the angels came with a message. In the New Testament, the angels come with the message that John will be born, that Jesus will be born. All the way through the Bible, they are, they are the, the bearers of the message. So this morning, we're going to reread the passage that we read last week. So we're going to look at Luke chapter 2, and I'm going to reread verses 8 to 20. This time, we're going to ignore the shepherds. And look at the angels. And there were shepherds living out in the field nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone round them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, sorry, today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You shall find, you will find the baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in a manger. And when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about the child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen which were just as they had been told. Trying to fill in those blanks, the first one's Gabriel. Now, I don't know that that, that it was Gabriel that that appeared. We're just told in in, in Luke 2 that an angel of the Lord appeared to them. We're not told who it was, but I think Gabriel's probably a good guess. As I think I mentioned a few weeks ago, Gabriel and Michael were the guardian angels of Israel. So, when Gabriel came to Zechariah, when Gabriel came to Mary, that was appropriate for him to do that as one of the guardian angels. We're not told who actually showed up to Joseph, but if I was forced to make a, make, make a, a prediction, I think it was probably Gabriel too. And I think it was probably Gabriel in this passage. There's a reason why. Uh, Gabriel was... Well, first of all, Gabriel, Gabriel was, his main function was to reveal. And so he revealed. He revealed that a child was going to be born to Zechariah and Elizabeth. He revealed that Mary would, would, would become pregnant with a child and, and that Jesus would be born. And this has been his, his path throughout the Bible. When, when Gabriel appears to Daniel, he interprets the dream. He, 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 he reveals what it is that, that the dream means for Daniel. When Gabriel appears in Ezekiel, he comes to destroy the temple. Again, revealing a message from God that, that Israel would have to do without a temple for a while. But each time he comes, he reveals something. But in, in Jewish mythology, Gabriel has another function. They believe that in the Garden of Eden, 
there was this tree of life, and, the, and this tree of life actually grew souls. And the souls would fall off the tree, and they would go into the chamber of God, or sorry, the chamber of Guth, or the treasury of souls. And then when a child was to be born on the earth, it was Gabriel who would go to, the cha- to this treasury of souls, and he would reach down, and he would grab a soul. And he would give it to the angel Layla, who would take it and place it inside the woman. And she would become pregnant. So if we're talking about you know, somebody who, who is announcing the birth, Gabriel makes sense, even though we know that this pro, pro, process did not happen for Jesus. Jesus was pre-existent. Jesus has been there since the beginning of time. He wasn't grown on some tree of life. He's always been there. But still, Gabriel was part of this message system. So likely... It was Gabriel. But we can't really prove that. But we know, this is what we do know, is that an angel came and he announced something to the shepherds. The good news, that Jesus Christ would be born. He gave them the message. And after he gave them the message, the rest of the angel host came and gathered around. And they said, glory to God in the highest heaven. And peace on earth to those on whom his favor rests. The situation as it came, it was kind of summed up with the idea of Pax Romana. Back in the time, it was a violent age. It was not a time when you really wanted to live. If you were rich and powerful, eh, maybe you had a bit of an easier time. You definitely had a different time. But it was more... There was more to it than that, and it was just a violent time to be alive. Shakespeare made the phrase, beware the Ides of March, kind of famous among those who have lived afterwards. The Ides of March is March 15th. And and what Shakespeare is talking about is that on May 15th, the Ides of March, the year 44 BCE, Julius Caesar was executed, was assassinated. What happened on the Ides of March was that uh, Caesar was becoming more and more powerful. He, he was gathering more and more powerful. In fact, it was as if he was becoming a god. And the Senate didn't like that. And so the Senate called a meeting and Caesar had to be there. And on March the 15th, the Ides of March, year 44 BCE, he he arrived at this meeting at the Senate and the conspirators fell upon him. And they stabbed him. And they stabbed him repeatedly. When his body was taken away, uh, a doctor looked at it and found the stab wound that would have killed Julius Caesar. But because there were so many people that were, that were there stabbing, nobody knew exactly who it was who had dealt that blow. But they were hoping, in a violent era, they were hoping for, for something different. And a Messiah had been born. A Messiah had been born in, in, in a place that was opulent and palace-like. And their, their hopes were in this Messiah. They called him the Prince of Peace. They, they, they called him the bringer of tranquility. The one who would end all of the wars. He would be the Savior of the world. And he was the Son of God. And his name was Octavius. Octavius grew, and when Julius Caesar, his father, his adopted father, died, Octavius began a campaign to take control of all of Rome. He dealt with those who would oppose him. He gathered around his, his, his guard. He took the city. And then he started to take the lands around Rome. And he brought peace 
to Rome. Pax Romana. If you were in Rome, you could go pretty much anywhere and know that you would not be harmed. Because the Prince of Peace had come. He called himself Caesar Augustus. And he had pushed the boundaries back so that peace would live in the land. But the problem with, with, with Pax Romana, with this peace that Caesar Augustus brought, was that it was a peace that came at a great cost. There was no freedom under his reign. Caesar Augustus was a great despot. He was tyrannical. He ruled according to what it is that he wanted to do. And nothing else mattered. It didn't matter who you were, rich or poor, powerful or weak. You all lived under this Pax Romana, this rule of Caesar. Virgil, the poet, saw saw Caesar Augustus as, as a great, great statesman who would change the way the world was run. He called the era under Caesar Augustus the golden age. And yet, things really didn't change. All that changed was that person who was at the very top of the ladder. Gregor the Great looked back at Rome and said that she died from material prosperity and the withering of the heart. Withered hearts from Rome to Carthage, from Athens to Alexandria, withered hearts embraced astrology, magic, the occult. There were gods for everything, even a god to teach a baby to suck its thumb. Superstition ran amok. amok. No values, no standards, no meaning. The glory of Rome hid the malaise of the soul, the angst which could not be quelled. No, the bloody gore of the gladiatorial arena could not quell it. The baptism in the blood of Mithras could not drown it. The deference to the cult of the Caesar would not bring peace. Pessimism, fear, helplessness, fatalism, these were the demons of the empire. There was no Caesar. There was no senator. There was no politician. There was no poet that could exercise these demons. The world needed something. They needed Pax Christi, the peace of Christ. And so during this, this time, we were told, during the reign of Caesar Augustus, this young couple, Mary and Joseph, they come from, from Nazareth, this little town in Galilee, to the hilltop town of Bethlehem, the town of David. There's no heralds guiding their way. No band played as they, as they walked along the road. There wasn't even a, a brick-covered road for them to walk on. They came in utter obscurity. A couple of weeks ago, my grandkids and I and Nelda, we watched the, the animated movie The Star together. I've always liked the movie. If you haven't seen it, it's an animated children's movie that talks about the coming of Jesus from the viewpoint of three animals. Bo the donkey, Dave the dove, and Ruth the the lamb. And they have all come together to follow the star. They all have slightly different dreams. Bo... He wants to be part of the royal caravan. He wants to be carrying the things of the king. He, he wants to be part of that, of that, of that ride where, where there are soldiers and there are animals and this prestige. And he wants to be part of that, but, but he's not. He's, he's just a donkey who helps gr- grind the, the wheat. Dave? Well, we find out Dave the dove just wants to be with Bo. And he will go anywhere just to be with Bo. And Ruth, Ruth is the one that sees the star and thinks there's something about this star. There's something that, that is different here. And I want to I follow that star until I find out what the message is. And so the three of them set out on this journey. And as we near the end of it, Bo finally decides, no, he wants to go with the royal caravan. He wants to get out of this. He doesn't want to be with Mary and Joseph. 
He wants to do something important. He wants to be with him. And so he sets off with Dave. Ruth stays watching this young couple as they move towards Bethlehem. Bo gets to the royal caravan. But all he can think of is Mary, his friend. And so he turns around, he apologizes to Dave and says, you know what? You, go, you can go be with the royal caravan. I, I'm going back to Mary and Joseph. And they come back and they carry, finally, in the, in the last days of Mary's pregnancy, she can't walk. And so they place her on Bo's back. And Bo carries his friend to Bethlehem. And there's no room in Bethlehem. There's, there's, there's no room in the inn. There's no, there's no guest room available for them. So they find a place in a stable. And Mary brings forth a child. You can imagine that scene. She gives birth to the baby. She cleans him, dabs him, warms him, feeds him, lays him in that feeding trough. And Bo is just glad to be there and be a witness of everything that had happened. And then, of course, things change when the shepherds come. And when the wise men come. And Neil at his feet and give him gifts and call him the king. And Bo realizes, kind of near the end of the movie, he says, I was part of the royal, of the royal caravan. Not the one that I thought I wanted to be part of. But I carried the king. We have this idea we need this peace of Christ suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel praising God and saying glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests peace it was a peace that Augustus couldn't bring it was a peace that recognized that we are all the same, rich, poor, weak, strong. It doesn't matter our cultural background. It doesn't matter what color our skin is. It doesn't matter. We are. We have a peace that comes from Christ inside of us. When all the world is upset and going wild, we know that God is still on the throne and that there is a peace that we are still following. Pax Christi, the peace Christ. And we are invited into that journey every Christmas. We're invited to go down that road, if we will. But too often, the peace we want is the Augustan peace. We want, we want the Pax Romano, even though it takes away all of our rights, even though it, 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 it makes us nothing but slaves. It is the peace that we think we want instead of the peace that this child in the manger brings to us. One more thing I just want to say, and I'm, I'm expecting letters and, and complaints. I said this about 10 years ago, almost 10 years ago, and I, you didn't complain about it then, so I'm going to try this again. In spite of everything that we sang in our carols this morning, in spite of what you saw happen up here with the kids, I want you to know this. Angels don't sing. Did you know that? Biblically, angels do not sing. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel praising God and saying, I checked, because I'm like that. I checked and I looked it up, and, and the word there is Lego, like Lego my ego. It's Lego. And Lego means to speak, to exhort, to point out with words. It never means to sing, in spite of all of our carols, which we now have to rewrite. 
I looked in Revelation too, and I said, each of the each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around. And under its wings, day and night, they never stopped saying, same word, Lego. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Angels don't sing. They speak their truth. Who knew that when we said you have a voice of an angel, we really meant that you sang like William Shatner, who speaks his truth. Angels don't sing, but we do. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And at once all the prison doors flew open, and everyone's chains came loose. That word back there, sing, sang hymns, is hymnio. To sing praise. Paul and Silas did it. And when they did it, then everything changed. A miracle happened because they were, they were singing. I had a friend a few years ago who um, complained that I get a little melancholy this time of year. I think it's just that there are so many things that are going on in life. Life is hard. And sometimes Christmas brings all of that afresh down on us. This past week has actually been a bit of a hard week for me. I got to remember the birthday of a good friend of mine who passed away a few years ago, Leslie Smith, who was my associate for a number of years and who guided me and taught me and did a lot of things that have shaped who I am. And I have to mourn the fact that Leslie is no longer with us. Surprisingly enough, my, my Facebook page reminds me every year that it's her birthday. And I go through remembering all about Leslie. I also celebrated or remembered the anniversary of a death of somebody that I never really knew. He was a preacher that I, I loved to listen to. He died December 17th, 2020. So just a year ago. His name was Mark Beeson. And he was the planner of Granger Community Church. And so as I came through this season, I remembered that Mark is no longer with us. And as much as I loved to listen to his message, messages, to listen to his, his teaching from Granger, I never met him. I only knew him through preaching of his sermons on the internet. But I just loved to listen to Mark preach. And one thing I remember Mark saying, I think he got complaints just like we do that the music's too loud. And so he got up one Sunday in front of his church and he said this. He said, I want you to know why the music's so loud. He said, we hire people to play loudly here. Because we know the reality, the truth. The truth is, is that the church is supposed to be a singing church. And so we get them to play loud so that you can sing. And you don't have to be afraid somebody might hear you. They sing loud so that you can holler out and make your noise to God without worrying about somebody else who might not think you sing good enough. Because that's our job. Back in September, when we were doing our launch Sunday, Greg and I were trying to do some stuff for the pre, the one that wasn't on Facebook. Facebook, you missed this one. So before the service got together, and, and, we, and we went live on Facebook. We had a little bit of a, of a party here. Greg and I did a bit of a video. We sang a couple songs. And one of the songs we sang was Cartoons by, by Chris Rice. And the, the end of that song says, what's the point of this Looney Tune? I'm not an animaniac. But there's a lot of praising to do. And cartoons aren't made for that. They're not. And apparently neither are angels. That's what we have to do. Do I think that on that hill there was singing that night? As the angels gathered in front of the shepherds? I am sure that there was singing that night. But it wasn't the angels doing the singing. It was the shepherds. Because that is our job. 
to hymnio, to sing praise to God for all that he is doing, to sing out our praise so that miracles will happen in our midst. We're going to close this series, this series and this service, and we're going to do it with a song. And just remember, this is our job. This isn't something that angels do. It's something that we do. We are the ones given the task to sing our praise to God. So let's lift up our praise together. Why don't you stand with us? What hope we hold this starlit night A king is born in Bethlehem A journey long we seek the light That leads to the hallowed manger ground What fear we felt in the silent name For a hundred years can he be found Broken by the baby's cry, rejoice in the hallowed manger ground. Emmanuel, Emmanuel, God incarnate, here to dwell. Emmanuel. for the opportunity to sing you praise. God, that you have given us all the gift to make a joyful noise. And you have given us all the reason to make a joyful noise. Because you sent your son here to live with us and die for us so that we can have peace. And we thank you for that. And God, we just ask that you would allow us to bring that peace out into this world. As we exit this place, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. And one more time, we just want to remind you, if you have tithes or offerings and you want to give, you can send them in an email transfer to vpcctreasurer at outlook.com or put them in the box here on your way out if you're in service. And let's end with one more song.
restores you. They make their face to shine all around you so that you are saved. The Father loves you. He makes his face to shine down on you so that you are saved. The Son graces you. He makes his face to shine right beside you so that you are saved. The Spirit lives in you. He makes His face to shine inside of you so that you are saved. The Trinity empowers you. They make their face to shine through you so that others will be saved. I invite you had time to, to worship with us this morning. We invite you to come back Christmas Eve, 6.30. We worship again and welcome the child in the manger to this world. And then, of course, we'll be back here right, right again on next Sunday morning, live at Vantage Point and on Facebook. Grace and peace be with you. Have a great week. Oh, come let us adore.
Oh, come all ye faith.